All right, everybody, it's four o'clock on Monday. Today, we're going to give a COVID update. We're going to give an update on our recovery from especially December's tornadoes and a few other pieces of news. But the most important thing for everyone uh, to hear today is that Omicron has not only come to the Commonwealth, it has hit us harder in terms of escalation of cases than anything we have seen to date. Let's put up the stair stepper chart to begin. Last week, 29,955 cases. That is twice as many cases as there were reported the week prior. We have never seen an escalation of cases, meaning how infectious this virus is than we are seeing with Omicron. We went from being in a relative plateau to the second highest week of reported cases since the start of the pandemic, surpassed only by the week of August 30th when the Delta variant was hitting us at its peak. Today's positivity rate, uh, last week's positivity rate, 20.38% was the seven-day average. It is 20.72% today. This is the highest since the start of the pandemic for any week or any day. Single highest day that we've had was on Thursday, December the 30th, when 6,441 cases were reported, which surpassed the prior peak of 5,742. And I believe that we will see more cases than last Thursday and 6,400 later in this week. Because when I go over uh, the cases that we had, especially through the weekend, we believe that there are some reports that haven't come in because of the long holiday weekend, and we are likely to see a further escalation from here. Due to the volume of COVID-19 cases and the speed at which Omicron is spreading, individuals who test positive or who are exposed Many aren't even contacting their local public health department, meaning that number of cases is probably uh, less. I can tell you is less than the reality. Uh, I believe that I've gotten calls from individuals that have tested positive uh, with at-home tests that if representative of the rest of the state, there are significantly more cases than this. So those who test positive ought to do three things. Number one, you've got to self-isolate. When you see this jump, the biggest jump that we have seen week to week by far, it means that if you have Omicron and you don't isolate, you will infect a ton of people. And yes, it appears to be less severe, though, with the number of cases, you're going to see hospitalizations and the rest are going up. But if you can infect a ton of people, more people than ever before in any variant, the odds that you infect someone who is unvaccinated or has pre-existing conditions is higher given the total number of people you may infect. So you have an absolute duty, if you test positive, to follow the procedures, to self-isolate. Otherwise, you could be causing severe harm to the people around you. Number two, you need to notify close contacts. This thing spreads so fast, you need to pick up the phone and call everybody you have been around recently. And listen, this is happening to a ton of people. So there doesn't need to be any guilt. And I talked to somebody early today that I was going to see today that couldn't come in because they had tested uh, positive. I hadn't been around them in, in more than a week. There's no guilt in this, right? This thing is spreading this quickly. We just need you to be willing to call those contacts and to let them know you've tested positive and they need to test themselves. And they need to be very careful until they have that test in. And third, you need to contact your health care provider if you need medical care. And I would urge, obviously, don't call the emergency room if you're fine, but your regular doctor that you see, if you test positive, I would at least give a call to so that they can monitor you and so that they are aware. Uh, the Department of Public Health has revised guidelines for uh, isolation and quarantine. Dr. Stack is going to talk about that in a minute. But if you go back to the original stair stepper chart, I mean, folks, look at this. Uh, Omicron is one of the most infectious, aggressively spreading 
uh, viruses that we have seen in my lifetime, certainly in the last hundred years as well. We hope that most people who get it, it will be mild, but for a number, it will not. And with that amount of cases, we are going to see strain on hospitals. We are going to see uh, more loss of life. And if we can be careful and get more people vaccinated, uh, the protection level is significant. Uh, let's look at our line graph on hospitalizations. As you will see, most certainly now going up. We've had the increase, the leveling off, and just like cases have shot up, hospitalizations are going up. Now remember, hospitalization trail cases. So this doesn't have this last week's huge number of cases and the amount of individuals who will end up in the hospital. I expect Omicron, by percentage, will have fewer people hospitalized per number of cases. But if there are six, eight, 10 times as many cases, we can end up with more people hospitalized pretty fast. The other concern is it spreads so quickly that it can uh, spread through our healthcare workers uh, in a way that could lessen the amount of capacity that we have. All of that is of concern. ICUs uh, going up. Again, this will trail hospitalizations, but going up. And ventilators, which will trail that. Uh, generally going up, but not nearly as much. I'm not sure uh, what we're going to see on the ventilator side, though it, I think it will increase from where it is now. But as compared to Delta, that'll be something that, that we'll see as we go. To break down the numbers, on the 30th of December, our highest case count, uh, 6,441 and 27 deaths uh, from counties all over the Commonwealth, people in their uh, 50s, certainly in that report. On New Year's Eve, 5,748 new cases, 28 new deaths. Uh, again, from people all across the Commonwealth, a number of people in their 50s, a 49-year-old woman in Clark County. January 1st, and remember, this is reports that came out on New Year's Day for those that were reporting on New Year's Day. 4,359 new cases, 26 new deaths, uh, as young as a 42-year-old from Montgomery County. Uh, the second 2,767 new cases. That is the reporting lag. It didn't go from 6,000 to 2,000. That's because of the holiday weekend. 24 new deaths, including a 26-year-old man from Jefferson County. And today, 4,111 new cases. And again, this is the holiday weekend. It's what we're seeing in every state. It's higher than that. 15 new deaths, including a 34-year-old woman from Carter County. Waning immunity, which we've talked about, the need to get a booster is so critical, and we'll share some good news in that. But still, even with waning immunity, we can put the vaccination status up. Even with what uh, Delta and the rest did, it is 82% plus of all cases, hospitalization, and deaths are unvaccinated individuals. What we're seeing with this one is it appears for most people, if you're fully vaccinated and you're boosted, you have your immunity up, people are getting it, but it is pretty mild and or it is tolerable. For those that have not gotten their booster, it hits them a little harder, but still uh, for, for many people, uh, they are able to make it without going into the hospital if they don't have pre-existing conditions. Omicron is hitting those that are unvaccinated hard just like other ones did in the past. And this is updated through December 29th, even with what we're seeing through Omicron, and it actually may get better with Omicron as, as tough as, as Delta was. Cases and vaccinations, 4.9 times higher likelihood of, of getting COVID if you were unvaccinated than vaccinated. In other words, the cases for unvaccinated in December were 
almost five times higher. So five unvaccinated individuals getting COVID for every one vaccinated individual. Um, those are our numbers that should have everyone wanting to go out and get their vaccine plus their booster. So vaccines, still incredible. Boosters, keep them incredible in terms of protecting yourself. So everybody out there who got their vaccine more than six months ago, and I think it's now down to five, I'll let Dr. Stack talk about that. You really need to get your booster, uh, especially now. And we are very, very close to kids 12 or maybe even 11 to 15 being eligible for their booster. The FDA has authorized it. It's now back to the CDC for final authorization. There is some indication that the CDC may authorize 11 uh, and up as opposed to just 12 and up. Once this goes through, I will tell you my son, it's been more than five months since he had his uh, second Pfizer dose. We'll be taking him to get his booster because we want him protected. We want to keep him in school and it's the right thing to do. On the vaccine front, uh, we do continue to see more people getting vaccinated and the pace has picked up at least some. 10,383 Kentuckians getting their first dose uh, over this long weekend. 25,488 getting their booster. So again, we need to see more, um, but you know these numbers were 3,000, uh, 4,000, know, three or four weeks uh, ago. So if we break down demographically, um, Kentuckians vaccinated, we're now up to 2,781,123 Kentuckians that have gotten at least their first shot. That's 62% of every man, woman, and child living in the Commonwealth, even those that don't currently qualify to get a vaccine. Of those that qualify to get the vaccine, two-thirds, 66%, have gotten at least their first dose. And of those that make their own health care decisions, this is up a point. 74%, nearly three quarters of everybody who can make their own decision on whether to get vaccinated have. In any other time, this would be the healthcare accomplishment of the century. I mean, getting in one year, three quarters of everybody 18 and up vaccinated would be nothing short of amazing. But as you've seen, there, we're facing our plague. That's what this is. Look at how many people it's taken. I mean, we're going to approach 13,000 Kentuckians, what, 820 plus thousand Americans dead. This is what we are facing, which means we got to do even better than the best ever if we want to protect our people better than we have ever seen. So if we break down demographically, still 92% of individuals 75 and up, that means eight people, 8% of that demographic is at significant risk and it's very likely they will get Omicron. Uh, because it's very likely most of us uh, might get Omicron. Uh, 65 to 74, up a percentage to 96%. These are the all-stars uh, of, of getting vaccinated in Kentucky. They've done an incredible job. We just need them to get boosted. 50 to 64, up a percent to 80%. So look at that. If you are uh, of, of the demographic 50 and up in Kentucky, at least 80% of every individual in that age group has gotten vaccinated. That crosses all types of demographics, party aff affiliation. You know, there's a lot of noise about some of that stuff, but remember, I mean, 75% of people 18 and up is a huge number that suggests that the vast majority of people know they need to be doing this to stay safe. 40 to 49, 70%, 25 to 39, 60%. And here's where we've got to get a whole lot better. You know, nationally, more kids are going into the hospital than we've ever seen. Kids are being hospitalized at a higher rate. I don't know that we have that data in Kentucky, but if it's happening in other places, it's the same Omicron variant. We need to be wary of it too. And we don't have especially our young adults or our kids vaccinated at nearly a high enough rate. And if we really want to make an impact on that overall 62% number or the two thirds, it's 24 and down that we really desperately need to get more people vaccinated. 53% of 
of 18 to 24, 49% of 16 to 17 year olds, 12 to 15, 45%. And this number five to 11 just went up 1% to 17%. If we wanna keep our kids in school, it's universal masking and increasing uh, that number specifically. So think about it. If you don't have universal masking in an elementary school uh, right now, but you have 83, 83% of every student in there unvaccinated, that's going to make it very, very difficult to continue what I want to see, which is our kids uh, in school with in-person learning. With that, let me turn it over to Dr. Stack for a number of updates, and then we'll come back and we'll update on tornado relief efforts. Thank you, Governor Bashir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the governor has already shared some of the high points for where we are with Omicron right now. Uh, just to emphasize a few of these things, if this weren't causing so much disruption to so many people's lives, it's an absolutely fascinating scientific evolution that this virus is doing. Unfortunately, it causes real tragedy and real harm for people. Uh, we had the highest ever single daily record number of cases last week on the 30th, I believe. We have the highest ever positivity rate for the entire pandemic. And remember, positivity rate is the number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests. We have hundred, well over 100,000 tests a day being done, PCR alone, and many, many more antigen tests on top of that. So we have way more testing than we did before. And we had a positivity rate lower when we were only able to test less than 100 people a day. I mean, this is really striking how much this virus has spread. Um, the hospitalization numbers are also increasing, as the governor said, thankfully, not quite as quickly. And there is some reason it still seems to be hopeful that Omicron may be a little more mild. But if Omicron reaches a peak that's half again or twice as high as the previous peak, there'll be plenty of people who are sick enough to need hospitalization. And unfortunately, it'll be predominantly unvaccinated folks who have no protection probably against the virus. So the situation is fluid and changing quickly, which leads to a number of the items that I'm going to update you on right now. So the CDC recently, as many of you are probably aware, updated its isolation and quarantine guidance. Now, I'm sympathetic to the CDC because everyone is trying their best to calibrate the interventions to keep people safe, to keep people at work, and yet uh, minimize the spread of the disease so that the healthcare system, which really quite frankly is teetering in some places, doesn't have even more strain. Uh, and I'll come back to that. So I'm gonna say three explicit populations. If you're in the healthcare setting, so if you run a hospital, a doctor's office, a nursing home, you should follow the December 23rd CDC guidance that's called the Interim Guidance for Managing Healthcare Personnel with Infection or Exposure to SARS-CoV-2. This was released just before Christmas, and it was intended to give hospitals a little bit more leeway so that they could, now they have to do a lot of steps to get down this path, but a little more leeway so that they could make sure they had staff available to take care of patients in need. The CDC quickly then came and followed up with another set of guidance, which was for the general public. Now this caused a little bit more difficulty. Their goal was trying to make sure that business didn't come to a halt, that airlines could still fly, that people could get where they needed to go and other businesses could operate. That guidance is a little more permissive than the healthcare setting. And they say that that is intentional because they wanna make sure that hospitals still are among the safest places you can go to get care. So you should still feel very confident that all the hospitals in Kentucky are gonna keep you safe and do the best they can uh, to make sure you have a, a uneventful course uh, during your stay there if you have to go in the hospital. The third audience, other than the general public, is K through 12 schools. And the governor teed this up very nicely just before I came up here. In schools, uh, the children are still largely unvaccinated and their ability to comply with mask use as properly as it needs to be done is just not as good as it needs to be, particularly when they go in cafeterias and other places because they have to eat and drink and you don't set a six-year-old or an eight-year-old all by themselves in the corner just to eat. It's not like an adult who can maybe go outside and eat in their car if they have to on a break. 
So the uh, school situation is different and the CDC has not yet revised those guidances. So I'm gonna walk through just a couple slides here real quick and then I'll build up to the school situation. So if you can show my first slide, please. So this is the test for isolation. This is if you test positive, what should you do? And there's some key numbers you should remember. The default in virtually all of these is 10 days. If you test positive, if you get exposed, you should generally isolate or quarantine for 10 days. The CDC allowed a number of ways you could shorten that or get out of that a little bit earlier. So on this slide, if your symptoms fully resolve, so you say you have little sniffles on day one and two, you get a test, you're positive, and by day five or six, your symptoms fully resolve, you can shorten the isolation period to as short as five days. But under all circumstances, you should stay home, stay away from school, stay away from other people uh, until you are past the five-day mark, even if all your symptoms resolve. But even there, the CDC says for 10 days, you should wear a well-fitting mask for the full 10 days. Now I'm gonna come back to that. In every one of these scenarios, the CDC says you should wear a well-fitting mask for the full 10-day period, even if you get out of isolation or quarantine earlier. And that's real important because I know there's a lot of, I don't like wearing a mask either, but a lot of folks just don't want to wear a mask. I think folks who are finished with discussing the evidence, the evidence is overwhelming. The masks slow the transmission of the disease. They don't do it perfectly, but they do it very well. So everybody needs to wear a mask for the full 10 days of isolation or quarantine. Um, but you could go back to work if you have no symptoms and just wear a mask for the last five days. That's a big deal. That helps get you back to work sooner. It helps keep businesses open. If you've tested for positive for COVID and you've never had symptoms, then after five days, wearing a mask for five more days, you can go back to work. All right. So that's on this slide, which we'll have on our website, I believe. And uh, I'm sure there's reporters who have taken pictures of it already. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. This is for quarantine. This is where your vaccination status starts to impact this here. If you are not fully vaccinated or you are eligible for a booster but have not gotten your booster yet, you should quarantine for 10 days after your last exposure. And here too, you could shorten it to five days if you have no symptoms, which means you haven't shown that you have the illness yet and you get a negative test on day five or later. So the CDC used to have a version that was a week long and they shortened this to five days. So if you have no symptoms, even if you're not vaccinated, and you get a negative test on day five, you can go back to work as long as you wear a mask, well-fitting mask for the next five days. If you are boosted um, and, uh, um, or, or fully vaccinated, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're fully vaccinated within six months of your second dose or fully vaccinated and boosted, so you're six months after your second dose of your vaccine, you don't have to quarantine at all, but they still recommend you get a test after five days and you should still wear a mask. In every scenario, because Omicron spreads so rapidly and so effectively, people are urged to wear a mask. So next slide. I'm not going to dwell on this as much. This, this is going to be um, posted as well. There's more to it on the bottom, and we'll try to reformat it so it's appropriate for social media. But there's a one-page infographic that will talk about this, the 10-5-10, about 10 days of isolation or five days if you're asymptomatic for isolation and just tested positive or 10 days for quarantine. And then underneath it'll tell you the ways you can get that to be shorter uh, on that infographic. So we'll have that posted on the website here today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, James, actually, hold on for one second on this one. So I'm going to talk real quick on therapeutics and then hand it back over to the governor. So, um, on, a, so on the vaccines, everybody who has gotten a vaccine should get a booster if you're two months or more after J&J &J, or if you're six months or more after your second um, Pfizer or Moderna. And I'll clarify for the governor now, I have the FDA's press release. So there, the FDA recommended 12 and up for boosters, and now the CDC will review that and almost certainly will approve it. And then everyone 12 and older will be eligible for a Pfizer booster, uh, and everyone who is 18 and over would be eligible for a Moderna or a J&J &J booster. So I urge you to get vaccinated. Hands down, it is the single most powerful medication tool we have to minimize the harm of this disease. Now I'm going to talk about monoclonal antibodies. So unfortunately, two of the three monoclonal antibodies that are FDA authorized for COVID-19 in the United States, so Regencov and BAM-ETE, and that's shortened for the, the longer chemical names, these two are ineffective against the Omicron variant. 
And when the proportion of variance goes up above 80%, uh, the guidance is that we should not use those because it's unlikely to help someone. So there's no justification to expose someone to the risk, however small it is when there's no likely benefit. And we're pretty much at that point now. So predominantly, we feel that the evidence, and again, it's imprecise, but we believe that we're at that 80% threshold. So sites are able to use up what little of these two medications they have if they're seeing people still benefit, but there are no more shipments coming into Kentucky as of today. Uh, and so there will not be any more Regencovi or BAM-ETE. This means these really effective treatments are going to hardly be available because there's only one remaining that works, citrovimib. And citrovimib, or, or citrovimab rather, we're only going to get um, probably less than 20% of what we would need to meet the demand. So folks, please go to our website. You can see where the monoclonal sites are. Uh, you can call and ask if they have access to monoclonals, but if they don't, it's not their fault. It's not our fault. It's really no one's fault. There's just none available because Omicron made the two most commonly available ones ineffective. I bet the scientists will come up with more, but it'll take a little time before we get that. Uh, particularly now, because we've lost those monoclonals, those vaccines are just so important because the vaccines do work against Omicron and all the evidence still supports that they're keeping people out of the hospital and out of the ICU. So please consider getting vaccinated. Now the next slide, uh, James, the oral antivirals. There's two of these. There's the Merck pill, Molnupiravir. Molnupiravir is now available in Kentucky, at least on a very limited basis for today. So today was the first day it was available. Um, Walgreens was the chain pharmacy that the federal government identified for the vaccine project that had the best geographic footprint for us to be able to use for the vaccines. So Walgreens, we reached out to and they have uh, worked with us on this and we're grateful to them. We only got 3,300 doses of Molnupiravir uh, for the first allocation. And, Walg and, and it's complicated. There's specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we started with 10 locations with Walgreens. Most of those are around the major highways, and we put two down in the tornado affected areas so that folks down there had access to it. So they will have 550 doses per store, and when they're gone, they're gone. And so it'll be two more weeks before they get another shipment, but that is where it'll start. This will go live on the website today by five o'clock today. It'll have the name of the store, its street address, and then you can uh, go to the Walgreens website if you want more information. About two weeks from now, this will extend to about 52 sites, and that'll be throughout the entire state, and every area development district will have at least one site in it. So that will expand. But if we get 3,300 doses, that means there's just gonna be a lot more per store. So folks, please be patient with these uh, people at the, the pharmacy. They're just gonna try to do the best they can to administer this to the people who are eligible. You will need a prescription from your doctor or other prescriber. Only physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants can prescribe this uh, for the federal government. And uh, there are a number of things. You have to be over 18. You can't be pregnant. You can't be trying to get pregnant. And if you're a man, you are encouraged to use birth control for at least three months after uh, you use the medication uh, because of some of its characteristics. And I'll leave the details for that for another time. Um, the final one, you can take that down, James, and there's no more slides, is Paxlovid. That's the Pfizer pill. The Pfizer pill doesn't have as many restrictions, and it appears to be a little bit more effective, actually a lot more effective, maybe 80-some percent effective in minimizing the risk of progression to severe disease. This one, we only got 720 doses, folks. The governor just stood up here and told you, what do we have, like over 20,000 new cases last week. We only got 720 doses. You don't have to do advanced math to know there's not enough to go around. Because it is so limited, we are going to just we've distributed uh, and they won't get it until tomorrow or Wednesday to just a handful of federally qualified health care centers, some long term care or nursing home pharmacies to try to ensure it gets to the most vulnerable, the most at risk for severe disease or hospitalization and, and helps those most in need. And so that's what we'll do for the first couple of distribution cycles. The federal government has said to the states that the uh, production is not likely to substantially increase until spring. So it's going to could be a wonderful drug, but it's going to take more time to get enough of it before people can just go take a prescription and get it filled. My final remarks here are that um, Omicron shows that COVID's not done with us, no matter how much we want to be done with COVID. Um, but January 2022 is not the same as January 2021. If you get vaccinated and you follow a few simple uh, pieces of guidance, 
your likelihood of getting severely hurt from Omicron or any other variant that we know of is extraordinarily unlikely. But that's if you get vaccinated. Um, so I would urge you to please get vaccinated. And then there's only a few other simple rules. Stay home if you're sick. If you got a fever, a cough, a sore throat, the sniffles, it doesn't make a difference what type of infection it is, folks. Don't go out and spread it. Nobody needs to have any doubt what kind of infection they have now. Don't go out and spread it. So stay home. Wear a mask, a well-fitted mask, if you're at any indoor settings with other people. Folks, I, I know we don't like these, okay? But this can be done. I think the kids show how well it can be done. The kids forget they have it on. They tolerate it just fine. It's us adults who get more frustrated with it than the kids. So please wear a mask and then get tested if you think you have COVID-19. I know that's going to be hard. There's so many people trying to get tested now. It's hard to get it. That's because too many people have this disease. And then this leads to the final thing I forgot to say about the schools. We got to have our kids in school, folks. We all know it's a priority we all share. This is not rural or urban or Democrat or Republican, we all know we need to have our kids in school and we're all committed to that. It is absolutely imperative that they take advantage of the test to stay program we set up. We've got 105 counties using that program. We've done over a half million tests since the start of the school year. We have a good test to stay program that the, the schools can use. Second, they've got to wear these masks, all right? I'm telling you, if you open a school this week, and you're not requiring masks, you're gonna infect the whole building in the first two weeks. I mean, it's gonna happen that fast. This virus is like measles. Measles is the most contagious known viral infection on the planet Earth for a very long time. And the only comparison that we can make for Omicron that seems even remotely apropos is that it's like measles. So folks, I urge you, if you're running a school, require masks when they come back to school after this New Year's break, use the test to stay program, and please, uh, we're, we're going to keep our regular guidance up that we had before, because if you use test to stay plus masks, no kid needs to miss school unless they actually have an infection. And then they shouldn't be in school because we can't afford to have COVID spreading around other folks. We can get through this. We can only get through it together, but I'm still convinced we're going to get through this together. And uh, I thank you for joining us along the way and working with us to uh, get through it. Thanks. All right, a few quick updates on tornado relief efforts, and then we'll get to questions that I know will likely be on Omicron. Today, I've asked the president to extend the 100% federal cost share for cleanup of the massive uh, effort required to restore our Western Kentucky communities impacted by the deadly tornadoes that took 77 Kentuckians, including 14 children. We are so thankful for the quick action and all the actions to date from the president, from Homeland Security, and from FEMA. Uh, we got an immediate emergency declaration, then a major disaster declaration. Then on December 14th, while he was in Kentucky, uh, the president provided that 100% uh, coverage for a 30-day period. Our challenge is as we close in on that 30th day, just in debris removal alone, we are probably at the 3% mark of what needs to be done. The Army Corps of Engineers estimates that it will be the end of April before they complete their mission, uh, the cost of which is over $100 million. So the need here is significant, and our request will be an additional 60 days at the 100% federal cost share. This is an unprecedented request. I'm, I'm asking for something that almost no one's asked for before, but this is an unprecedented disaster. Even those that have been in FEMA for decades, walking around Mayfield or walking around Dawson Springs, would look not just at us, but each other and say, this is different. The, the level of devastation and and the, the amount of work that's going to be required to just get us to a build back point is so significant. Um, we need the assistance. If the 25% cost share is initiated, the cost to about 16 impacted counties would be about $67 million, possibly even more than that. Most recent storms over the New Year's holiday indicate substantial impacts to homes, commercial properties, water distribution centers, roads and bridges as well. And many of these happened in these same counties. 
Unfortunately, another disaster declaration request may be forthcoming, but given everything we're facing, uh, we really need that additional 100% federal share, and we will advise what we hear back. Uh, okay. Um, on December 28th, I signed an executive order to su temporarily suspend the work search requirement in the waiting week period for UI and disaster unemployment assistance claimants impacted by the tornadoes. I'm happy to report that the United States Department of Labor has approved that request. This means that UI claimants that are unemployed due to the tornadoes that work or live in the 16 counties that are included in the major disaster declaration uh, can get benefits almost immediately once approved. This will not include claims starting on December. This will include claims starting on December 10th, but only in the 16 counties under the disaster declaration. Here are updated locations for this week's unemployment insurance DUA clinics, in-person clinics designed to give people the help they need. They are Tuesday through Thursday, January 4th. They are uh, through the 6th from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. In Bowling Green, they're at 262 Scottsville Road. And in Mayfield, they're at 351 Charles Drive. It's not necessary to attend the in-person session, but we've learned over the last 22 months that you really want to go to these because it is a difficult system you are likely to make a mistake without going to one of these, and it may impact your ability to qualify uh, for these benefits. The deadline to apply is January 18th, 2022. Uh, Berrien and Barron and Marion counties have a, a little bit longer, January 27th, 2022. You can go to kcc.ky.gov for updated information. Uh, disaster SNAP benefits, which is additional food assistance that we've worked hard to make available, have been approved by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food, and Nutrition Service for Kentuckians who live and work in 14 of the counties impacted by the tornadoes. The disaster SNAP benefits were approved December 30th for short-term food help for individuals and families living in Caldwell, Christian, Fulton, Graves, Hart, Hickman. Hopkins, Logan, Lyon, Marshall, Muhlenberg, Ohio, Taylor, and Warren counties. Kentuckians residing or working in Barron and Marion counties will have an opportunity at a later date. What this does is give food assistance to low-income households with food loss, loss of income, or damage caused by a natural disaster. Approved beneficiaries will receive an electronic benefit card. That's the EBT card. The card is used just like a debit card to buy food at most local grocery stores. Because of the unique needs of disaster survivors, there are some different standards for disaster or DSNAP than the regular SNAP program. You may qualify for DSNAP if you had one of the disaster related expenses below. Home or business repairs, temporary shelter experience expenses, evacuation or relocation expenses, home or business protection, disaster-related personal injury, lost or no access to income due to the disaster. In some cases, food loss after a disaster like flooding or power outages. So we would encourage everybody who has run into any of these issues and we're working directly with local leadership to apply. Um, you can call DSNAP at one 371 8570 That is the fastest. Applications are taken by phone 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, and on Saturday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Applications can also be made at the DCBS offices in these counties. In Grace County, you can go to the Purchase Area Development District office, and we've established an additional site in Dawson Springs at the Outwood facility. Residents who currently receive SNAP benefits can request and, reply and apply for replacement of benefits due to power outages and other impacts. Replacement requests must be made by January 10th. Again, for those, you can call the regular DCBS number, 855-306-8959. And finally, let's end today the opposite of how we began, which uh, is concerning. Let's end with exciting. 
You know, when we look at 2021, it's a year of great difficulty, a pandemic taking so many lives, natural disasters bookending uh, that year, yet more opportunity, more potential prosperity created in 2021 than at any year in my lifetime. We have now closed the books on 2021, and I can confirm that we broke every economic development record that we have ever tracked. Last year, more than 260 companies announced over $11.2 billion in new investments that will contribute to over 18,100 full-time jobs in the coming years. Both of those, total investment and the jobs, all-time state records. It's economic growth unlike anything we have ever seen before, and they were at the second highest hourly wage that we have seen in any year in our history of economic development. More jobs and rising wages means real opportunity. And in um, my state of the Commonwealth, coming up later this week, we're going to talk about how exciting these opportunities are, that they are occurring in every part of the Commonwealth, not just in a couple cities. And these are jobs of the future. And everything from electric uh, uh, vehicles uh, to recycled paper mills, to agriculture technology, uh, to space. Uh, we are truly attracting the types of jobs that are going to be here in 30 to 40 years, and more major companies are betting on us with their biggest projects ever than ever before. Just think about it. We are now home to the largest projects ever in the history of Ford and Amazon, of Pratt, which is now a half billion dollar facility. And this year we had the single largest announcement in our history with the Blue Oval SK Battery Park in Hardin County, nearly $5.8 billion, 5,000 new jobs. This is Ford and SK betting their future on us and we are not gonna let them down. It was Toyota investing another nearly half a billion dollars because they believe in us to compete in electric vehicles right here in Kentucky. Uh, it just shined a light on the importance of manufacturing, where we've now proven that we can do things in Kentucky that people thought couldn't be done in the United States. Look at GE in Louisville with two announced expansions this year, making refrigerators, which nobody thought could be brought back to the United States and continuing to grow and to add jobs. Food and beverage, agritech, metals, logistics, distributions. I got to tell you, while we've got a pandemic that we've got to beat and we will beat it, and while we have seen natural disasters, the ferocity of which I can't explain, I do know that if we can get through the darkness that are those challenges, the light that is ahead of us is greater than I have ever seen. And the future of this Commonwealth is brighter than many of us imagined it could ever be. So stick with us. We will make it. We will get through these challenges. Sadly, we're going to lose more people before we do. But what's waiting on the other side is as special as we are as a people. We are good people that look out for one another. And we deserve a good future. And we've got one coming up. Final plug, State of the Commonwealth this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, we're going to talk about the year that was and what's to come. We'll give a little preview of the budget address, which is coming up. It's our chance to turn two years of great economic progress into 20 years of incredible prosperity for our people. But we will have more resources to make wise investments, to make sure that we are never a flyover state ever again. We are the destination. I think that's our destiny, and now is our time to grab it. So with that, we'll open it up to questions. First, to those we have um, here in uh, studio, uh, Karen Zarr. Thank you, Governor. Several school districts in the country have already announced that because of their numbers, they're going to have to start virtual. Um, others, of course, have the mask mandate. If you still have the power not only mask mandates but are there any other safety mandates that you would issue not only for schools but for businesses based on today's numbers here in kentucky 
So if I still had the authority to do so, uh, masking would be required in every Kentucky school because no school is going to make it without doing it. If you look at the numbers that we have seen and you heard Dr. Stack's expert opinion, they're not going to make it two weeks without infecting the entire building, and maybe it's less than that. When you look at our vaccine numbers, which I'm really proud of, the part that we're not cutting it, that we haven't done enough, is our kids that would be in school where at least half of them are not vaccinated. And now we have the uh, the most aggressively spreading uh, variant that we have seen. Um, we'd look at some other things as well about if you've had it, testing and, and what it'll take right now, it's guidance. Um, certainly we would look at, at making that a requirement, but I think schools are all uh, following that. Uh, and then we talk with the districts themselves. Uh, about other needs that they have. Certainly the amount of testing that is available to them is very helpful uh, right now. Um, encourage, I would encourage every school district, first of all, to do universal masking, but second, do another round of vaccine clinics that just give people the option, especially with what we're seeing right now, as long as parents agree, give kids the option to get a vaccine any day that they're in school once the parents say yes, Let's make sure that we can get that done. Uh, businesses, uh, we'd have talks with the business community. Um, I, as the CEO of the executive branch of state government, I'm going to continue to require masking in our places of work. That is both to protect the health of our people, but it is also to protect our workforce. We do very important things uh, that from bridge inspections, right, making sure that people are safe crossing them. Uh, to, to driver's licenses, to building inspections, so many to processing unemployment claims, to our, our folks in the transportation cabinet that are cleaning uh, the roads in these hard hit areas. This is a variant that can wipe out your workforce for a period of time very quickly. And I, as the CEO of my workforce, um, think that a mask is a very small uh, but very effective step to preserve that workforce. Tom. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon to you. Um, speaking of workforce, have you had any issues with state government staffing due to COVID and especially the new Omicron? And have there been any COVID outbreaks in the uh, tornado area that you're aware of? Now we've got enough time to so, so I was down in Mayfield today, and at least um, one of the first responder groups has started seeing uh, cases of Omicron, I wouldn't call it an outbreak because it, it hasn't hit their entire uh, workforce, but are already seeing less personnel for public services. Uh, we've had uh, people that we've been advised have, have tested positive, uh, sure, that work in state government, but we haven't seen any specific units that have gotten hit incredibly hard. Since we went to mandatory masking in our workplace, we haven't had one major outbreak. And that's when there have been major outbreaks at other employers that, that have not required it. Uh, we continue to urge uh, vaccinations amongst our workforce. I think we could do better and we'll continue to push to do better. Uh, Austin. Thank you, Governor. Uh, with the session coming up tomorrow, Republicans say that they're going to file a bill to push the filing deadline back to the 25th. Um, assuming that comes to your desk, will you sign it before the current deadline of January 7th? So I haven't had the first conversation on moving the deadline other than uh, the speaker told me that they would file a, a bill to, to do it. And I told him that I would take a look at it, but I'd want to have a conversation with them. I also want to see the redistricting plan that I think will be filed at the same time. So I don't think one decision is made in a vacuum without uh, the the other piece. I've seen the overall house maps that I think everybody else has, but without the precinct level data, it's hard to have an analysis there. We haven't seen the Senate maps or the congressional maps or the Supreme Court maps. So that'll be a, a wait and see. And even once they're filed, it'll probably take a couple days to, to get our arms uh, around it. Mike. Thank you, Governor. Uh, when Cornell University started experimenting with shortening the isolation period in, I think, October, uh, they stipulated that fully vaccinated students could leave isolation if they tested negative twice. 
you think the CDC should have had a test out requirement when they updated the guidance? So the CDC, the, the question is on the, the CDC guidance and, and using an example from Cornell. Um, I want to be as supportive of the CDC as I can. They are trying, but the level of communication, I believe, with either our state public health officials or governors um, has decreased over time. Uh, we would have liked to have had more input. We would have liked to have done more analysis. I'm not sure we agree with every piece that is uh, on it. And we certainly have some concerns that I believe are now being expressed uh, nationally. Now, again, I believe that the CDC is trying to do their best. I believe that they're trying to balance uh, a number of things. Uh, I would have appreciated more collaboration on I mean, both Dr. Stack and I have been fighting this pandemic for longer than the current leadership of, of some of these organizations uh, have been in their offices. We respect them. We like working with them, but there are things that we would have done differently. Once the CDC puts it out, it's hard to do it differently. And again, that might be analyzed as not being supportive. We'd just like to see something different. Moving into the so, so future. So when when people leave isolation, if they have been positive, they certainly need to test negative. In my opinion, at least once. I would, if it were me or my family, want to test negative at least twice. And we already wear masks, but I would continue to wear a mask for a period after that because you know, if I get COVID, I'm probably going to be okay minus a, a few small underlying conditions. My worry has always been about my family and my friends, uh, the citizens and people around me. And so my biggest concern coming out of isolation would be the potential to infect other people. Uh, I would also uh, wanna do a PC, full PCR test if it were me, um, as opposed to just a, a rapid test. You wanna add anything, Dr. Stack? I was giving my personal opinion. You don't have to give yours. Yeah, no, okay. Good. Um, Grayson. Oh, we lost. Okay. Uh, we'll go to who we have virtually unless we have Rick Schobel. Nope. Okay. Scotty virtually. Where where do we start? WVLT? Nope. Corinne Boyer. We're getting closer to the end by the minute. <laughs> of the press conference. <laughs> Corinne, are you there? Just having trouble coming through. Let's try Debbie Yetter. All right, while we wait, any follow-ups for you? On the redistricting maps, so the question is thoughts on the redistricting maps. I, you know, I, I don't like to, I don't like to have emotional responses to something like this. I like to see the, the underlying data, um, you know, being somebody that lived in Jefferson County for 15 years, uh, I have some concerns about that map. It seems to be, uh, and 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 what it does, uh, also possibly Lexington. Now there are some things that I've seen that I think could be a, a positive. You know, Hopkins County is its own district, and there hasn't been a representative that lives in Hopkins County uh, for many years. Uh, they they I think they have five different districts went into to Hopkins County. So I want to see more before ultimately making a. Uh, a final decision. I, I want to make sure that they are fair and that with, you know, 75 members already from one party, they, they weren't drawn in a way to, to uh, let, let's say, intentionally try to move to an even larger majority than that, as opposed to create proper districts. 
Yes. Will the team Western Kentucky Fund, I know it's earmarked from the December 10th tornadoes, but since there was damage over the weekend, will anybody affected in Western Kentucky over the weekend potentially be able to benefit from that? So right now the Team Kentucky Fund, uh, Team Western Kentucky Tornado Relief Fund was constructed for the December 10th tornadoes. We'd have to make an alteration in executive order or or maybe even ultimately regulation to include others, uh, but it's a lot of the same counties and sometimes even the same families that are impacted. Uh, Governor, with the, the, some kids being able to use the Pfizer, uh, get Pfizer booster mm -hmm. now, if they had Moderna fully vaccinated or Johnson & Johnson, can they still get the Pfizer booster? So uh, most kids were only eligible for Pfizer when it opened up. So, you know, every, every uh, kid that's still under that age group would have gotten Pfizer and then still needs to get Pfizer. I had a couple of issues, a couple of questions that were sent in. Am I planning to provide my state of the Commonwealth address in person in the chambers as of today? Yes. Uh, now we just saw the jump in Omicron cases. So um, I'm, I'm at least going to reserve the ability to try to do the right thing if the right thing changes. Uh, second, how are national supply chain issues and increased price of construction materials affecting the rebuilding and repair efforts in Western Kentucky? I think that that's probably an issue that we're going to face in the coming weeks. Right now, we're still in more of the cleanup phase. And we've got everybody else back. Corinne Boyer. Hi, Governor. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, many news outlets are reporting that Omicron is expected to peak in about mid-January. Um, is there an estimated peak that it might or is there a date that it might peak in Kentucky? Well, we certainly think it would be later than places that it started uh, faster. So if you look at a place that's suggesting that, you know, one way to do it is look how many weeks earlier they started the escalation that we're going through now. But, but I do believe that it's not going to be uniform everywhere. There's going to be things like vaccination rates, how hard potentially we got hit by Delta. We don't know how much that'll respond. So it, I think each area is going to be unique. And I think it's our job to do everything we can to make it peak as early as we can by getting vaccinated and wearing masks. Debbie Yetter. Oh, hi, I think I'm here this time. Um, did you have any more thoughts about the redistricting maps in particular, what they do to some of the counties and some of the legislators who will be uh, required to run against each other, for example, in Jefferson County? Uh, I'm trying to reserve judgment until we can get the electronic files, see precincts, really get a, a better understanding. I am, I am concerned at the outset about what appears to have happened in Jefferson uh, and Fayette counties. Alternatively, I mentioned Hopkins County will have, if if that part of the map goes through, the first representative that has lived in Hopkins County uh, in, 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 I think, at least uh, six years. Uh, also, still want more information on what's been done to, to Frankfurt and others. You know, at a time when one party has 75 of 100 seats, I just really like to see some fair maps. I think once you have that type of supermajority trying to to draw maps to where you can have three or four or five more, not not the right thing to do. And I think it has a risk of of backfiring once you once you reach that stage. Could you uh, unintentionally create more districts uh, where where they are more competitive and attempt to do the opposite? I certainly think that the the, the risk there, if that's what you're trying to do, increases. Uh, April Rickert. Hi, thank you. Um, how much Omicron is showing up in Kentucky samples so far, and what do you expect with COVID deaths in the coming weeks based on other states? Thank you. So we think, we think everything is Omicron by this point, and if it's not, it is substantially all. I don't have our most recent analysis. Probably better more. Uh, Dr. Stack says it's 80% or more. Of, of what we're seeing, but it's here and it's going to be everything by next week if it's not already. Hard to predict deaths. Uh, hard to know how deadly this one is and the different factors are 
seems to cause less severe illness. Vaccines still hold up, it appears, for preventing severe illness. Boosters, even better, and they are readily available. And we got hit pretty hard with Delta. People, uh, hopefully, uh, will be wearing masks more often now that we are seeing this and we have an uptick in vaccinations. I think all of those factors are going to be what determines it. Again, I'm also, we're, we're concerned not just about deaths from COVID, but if we see too much hospitalization, uh, at the same time we're seeing the workforce decrease because healthcare workers are getting Omicron, then we risk uh, having preventable deaths for things like car accidents and strokes and heart attacks where we would otherwise be able to provide significant treatment to folks. But if we're spread too thin because of this, then we lose people for other reasons as well. Uh, Melissa Patrick, Kentucky Health News, to close us out. Um, hi, Governor. Um, so is there a scenario that would prompt you to ask localities or to ask the legislature to allow you to place restrictions on high-risk activities to slow the spread of COVID right now during this Omicron spread, and uh, as two Harvard researchers have recently proposed? Uh, thus far, I have or I am asking the General Assembly to return uh, authority to require masking in public schools. I don't expect them to do it, but I do believe it's necessary. And I think we've seen the pressures at the local levels are just too much uh, for some leaders to do what I think each one knows is necessary and right. But it's also really unpopular or could be unpopular. I, I actually think the majority wants it in the community that they're in. I'm willing to take that hit. I'm willing to be the unpopular guy if it means that my kids and everybody else's are not only protected in schools, but that they uh, also can stay in school. My administration's response to, to COVID has never been about doing the easy thing or the popular thing, but the necessary thing and what's right. And that's what we'll continue to do with each decision we have the authority to make. Okay, folks, Omicron is real. It is escalating very quickly. You have the tools to protect yourself. Get vaccinated, wear a mask. Uh, we'll see you for the State of the Commonwealth on Wednesday night. Thank you.